Hi, guys. Um, so my name's Casey, and like one in five young women of my generation, I have fought a severe mental health battle. Um, I have clinical depression, clinical anxiety, and in the past, I've fought against self-harm and suicidal thoughts. Now, I was never good at science in high school. That's why I'm studying arts, literature, and communications. But the one thing I do remember is that when you stand in the eye of a storm and you look up, you still see pretty blue skies. Now, think back to all of your first weeks in high school. Some of you are mad at me because you're having to think back further than you would like. But think back to those times where you had to introduce yourself. You had to share interesting facts. You had to make conversation. Do you remember how nobody knew what to say? It's because we're all standing in the eyes of our own storms. So for us, when we look up, all we see doesn't feel that special. That was my whole issue with getting up here today and trying to figure out the right words to tell you guys. But then I realized my storm is my story. And not only is it my story, but hopefully it can be the starting point to you guys realizing that it's time to embrace your storm, to learn from it, and to grow from it. And I know one talk from a 17-year-old probably won't weather it all, but hopefully it can start to feel more like a breeze. So my storm started slowly. Panic attacks sprinkled in here and there, sprinkles of self-confidence issues, spoonfuls of self-doubt, but nothing I couldn't manage. And then towards the end of my grade nine year, I got into a relationship that in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have been in, but nonetheless, I was in it for a lot longer than I would have hoped. The rising action of my storm came towards the end of that and was actually the whole reason we broke up. Now, it wasn't an eye of the storm anymore. It was me being ripped apart, torn to shreds, and spinning in circles with my storm. And then I did the weirdest thing. I pulled out my phone one night while I was lying in bed in the middle of a mental breakdown, and I tapped open the notes screen, and I just started writing and writing and writing. And with every little click of my keyboard, my heartbeat seemed to slow down. Now, I don't know how this works, but I know that it did, and I know that it still does. Now, some of my friends are going to hate me for this reference, so bear with me, but have any of you ever heard of the Broadway musical Hamilton? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, long story short, it's, about, it's a musical about one of the founding fathers of the United States, and he did a whole bunch of important stuff that I'm not going to get into. But he came from nothing. He came as an orphan from the Caribbean who woke up one morning with literally nothing to his name. But he was smart. So he worked for one of the trading companies, because this was a long time ago and that was a thing. Um, and he did all their writing and their records. And someone noticed how smart he was through his writing. So it was through the words that he decided to write down on a page that he was able to propel himself out of his hell and into what eventually turned into a life of prosperity, but not only for him, but for his country. So, Barring the whole contributing major building blocks to one of the world's most powerful countries, I kind of see a parallel in my story to Hamilton, because we both used writing to write our way out of hell. So going back to that note on my phone, slowly this little quick write began to take on a life of its own. And months and months of work with some of the most dedicated people you will ever meet led me to get up on a stage not unlike this one, and for the first time in my life, I laid it all out there every small pent-up ounce of pain and anger and confusion poured out through me through that microphone. And with every ear that it reached, with every person that came up to me telling me how necessary it was, telling me how brave I was, start to hurt a little bit less. So here's part one of my story. This is Gaines. You put me on a pedestal. <laughs> You called me princess and made me feel pretty for the first time in a decade. And then single-handedly, you took it all away. In case your mama never taught you, girls' bodies are not your personal playground. My mama taught me love isn't a game. But I guess you didn't get that lesson. How else do you explain how you treated my body like your childhood game cupboard? I am not a game cupboard. I'm not a twister map, but that didn't stop you from letting your brain be the spinner, telling you to put your left hand on breast and your right on the rest. My breast isn't blue and below my belt isn't red. But you didn't understand that. I'm not a monopoly board. I'm not something you can own the second you get to it. You traded your place on the street of my heart for a one-night stay on Pleasure Avenue. I am not a doll. 
But that didn't stop you from trying to play dress up. Sorry, dress off with me now, did it? I am not a doll, but that didn't stop you from trying to get me to move and talk in a way that would make you happy. You told me you loved me. So I guess that's what love is now, a sick, twisted game you pull out of the cupboard when you're bored. My body is not a time machine that will take you back to a time when you didn't understand the word no or the word stop. Let's see if you understand this. Assault. Oxford describes it as to make a physical attack on, but it wasn't making an attack to you, was it? No. To you, it was just an, oh, you looked so good. To you, it was just an, oh, I just wanted to make you make that noise. Yeah, well, to me, it is now another scar on a brain that was already a tally chart of cicatrixes. To me, it is the push over the edge into fear and anxiety at the touch of another man. To me, it is the replay reel in my head accompanied by a soundtrack of why did he do it? And am I really that worthless? To you, those five minutes were natural, normal, healthy. I mean, you were never taught differently, apparently. But to me, those five minutes were the five minutes where I stopped being a person and I became a toy. Now, I am not a toy. And no matter how long I let you take that away from me, baby, believe me, I'm taking it back right here, right now. So for all the things, I am not a playground, a game cupboard, a twister mat, a monopoly board a doll, a time machine, a toy. I am passion, I am strength, I am fire, I am ice, I am whole. This is me, and it's my turn. So that was part, oh. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so that was part one. Now, not only did games spark the healing from that specific event, but it also sparked a realization in me about how powerful of a coping mechanism writing is to me. But I never could have imagined how much I would need it. Because slowly, shortly after my first round of performances of games wrapped up, my storm picked up speed, and my storm became a full-blown tornado. And I really wish I could take credit for that metaphor, but I can't. Um, I remember sitting on one of my best friend's couches one day, having another mental breakdown, surprise, and trying to describe what it felt like in my head. And at that point, I hadn't been diagnosed. I'd never really been able to vocalize what was happening to anyone, not even to a paper. And I just remember sitting there saying it felt like it was spinning and spinning and spinning, and I was standing in the middle, completely stuck, because one inch to any side, and I'd be torn to shreds. So he hit me with the tornado metaphor, and it stuck. Because ever since then, before pills, and even sometimes after pills, it's been the visual that I need to tie it back to. It's been the visual that lets me hold on to that last little bit of sanity. So in case you couldn't realize by now, I really like hiding behind metaphors. I have a bad habit of it, and probably bad habit is the wrong way of putting that. I'm addicted to hiding behind metaphors behind abstractions, behind things that let me tell you what's going on without having to directly vocalize it, behind things that allow me to communicate without having to sit down and have a conversation with my problem. And it's a natural coping mechanism. We all do it. Case in point, when someone dies, we don't go around saying that. We say they passed away because it allows us to put a barrier between us and the pain. And that's what I was doing. Because writing, and especially writing metaphors, was the most constant and the healthiest way of coping. So a lot of the times people will ask me what it's like to be depressed. And having had the illness for a couple months, I've now finally been able to put it into words. And my favorite way of describing it is depression is like fighting shadows in a dark room with a blindfold. You can't win. There are no lights, there are no names, there are no titles, there are no faces. It's just you. And no matter how much you feel like you're prepared for it, you're not. No matter how many times I told myself that there was no way I was letting my own brain beat me that day, I would always end up crushed. So it really should come as no surprise that I, the piece that I've written that best encapsulates my battle with depression is called Prescription Metaphors. And I wrote this right after I was diagnosed. So, my depression is a tornado. It's 
spinning cotton candy out of my sanity, but I'm so desperate for sweetness that I choke it down, breaking the promise I made to myself not to eat, to make it easier to disappear. But that didn't matter since it all came back up. It wasn't sponge sugar, just rock salt. My depression is the obligation invite to a birthday party. Everyone knows it doesn't quite belong, but everyone's nice to it. After all, there's a reason it got the invite, so you sit down and make small talk, praying for the awkward introduction to end so you can go back to living. That can't happen. You can't ignore the obligation's presence. That would be rude. So everyone makes a silent deal to be polite and pray this ends quickly. My depression is a suitcase. It holds every aspect of my life, life close enough so that I know it's there but reminding me that I can't have anything unless I open it up first. And I've never been able to pack light so soon that suitcase is holding everything I know and it's following me around on a trip I no longer want to be on. The suitcase I can't lose is too heavy for my arms to hold, so I carry it under my eyes. My depression is a war zone and as my mind lands on the landmines, I hide behind metaphors. So that was that one. Um, oh, we're doing the clapping thing, okay. Um, so finally, I realized that I couldn't hide anymore. I realized that I needed to get help. And I had thought about getting help for a really long time, but because we grow up in an environment where depression is explained to us as this far off concept that we never think will actually affect us, I didn't think what was happening was actually happening. But I hit a point where I realized that this had to be chemical and this couldn't be character. So on January 29th, 2018, I walked into a psychiatrist's office for the first time. Not only that, I also wrote my math midterm in the morning and I bought a prom dress. So it was like a really productive day. <laughs> and I thought the psychiatrist appointment was gonna be the most excruciating part of that day. And keep in mind, I limped through grade 10 and 11 math. And turns out, not even walking out of that store with a dress that I felt like a goddess in matched the elation my little heart felt when I was handed that prescription paper for the very first time. And no, it wasn't a one-way ticket to happiness. But it was a car that I could finally drive. It was confirmation that this is going to get better. So it wasn't easy. Nothing ever is. Um, we had to play with dosages, we had to play with pills, but finally, we found the medication that I am still on to this day. A tiny little pill that helped me take down a whole tornado. So here I am, with a storm and a hope that it can help someone, anyone, realize that a storm, a hurricane, a monsoon, a tornado, no matter what you want to call it, isn't the end. It's just a starting point to grow, to embrace it, and to realize that if this 17-year-old can be chemistry with help of character, someone else can too. And those pills and that character and a whole lot of amazing human beings help me get back to the girl that I've fallen in love with, get back to the girl standing on this stage today. And before I go, I just want to introduce her properly. So this is the last thing I'm going to say. This is Hello, My Name Is. I was once asked to describe myself in one word, broken. Because when I looked in a mirror, that's all I saw. Little pieces of who I used to be, as abstract as a constellation, minus the beauty. I was one of those connect the dot pictures nobody quite bothered to finish. I saw a shadow, I was hollow and cold and gray with everything to say, but no voice. And even if I, even if I could find a voice, I don't see anybody around to hear it. So I lived with the whispers in my head telling me I wasn't good enough, telling me there was no point in fighting anymore, telling me I wasn't even worth the fight. I was tired of fearing the mirror and the scale and the world. I was tired of hurting myself so I didn't have to hurt other people, so I watched. I watched my finger push back. I watched words leave the gun. I watched screams break the mirror like throwing a pebble in a lake, but like a boulder in a puddle. I watched the wave crush me. I watched my panicking legs trying to find solid ground. And suddenly, there was nothing to see. The world was dark and hollow and silent. The way I used to want it. 
That's the thing with used to. It's in the past. The wave has receded and I'm dancing on my newfound solid ground of low tide. And yes, I know monsoon season will arrive. It always does. But that's why I built sandbag walls sky high around my heart so only the end of the world could tear it apart. But I'm not there yet. For now, I'm here. Standing, breathing, absorbing, because it's been a while since I've been able to take a breath without the weight of the gun, because it's been a while since a list of my favorite things included myself. And I don't want to forget it. So I leave footprints in the sand so my directionally challenged self can always find her way back here. Here to the place where my stretch marks are no longer stretch marks, but tiger stripes. Reminding me I am fierce enough to take on anything this world dares to throw at me to the place where my thighs touching is no longer the lack of a gap but a banner. Reminding me to never let anyone tell me the best part of me is my negative space to the place where the chunk of scar on my wrist is no longer the tattoo of a mistake but the tapestry of a survivor. Reminding me that I am beautiful because of what I went through. I survived through who I was to get to who I am and let me be real with you, some days I didn't know if I was going to get to meet this girl. But she was worth the wait because I am worth the fight. All the night spent gasping for air, thinking this isn't fair, are long gone in the rearview mirror, finally making me understand why the windshield is so much bigger. So I could see that broken isn't a way of life, but a temporary pit stop on my way to the rest of my life. And let me tell you, my name might sound better rolled off of someone else's tongue but it was crafted to be bounced out of my cracked lips with the nervous stutter of someone who still rehearses here before attendance to tell you, hello, my name is Casey, and I'm happy. Thanks.